For over a century, the sound of hammering steel has come from this tiny smithy in the village of Docking, near the east coast of England. Inside, Claude Riches uses tools he inherited from his father. Blacksmithing is hard on the body. The ancient art sets a man's muscle against molten metal. For Claude, working this forge is a lifelong profession, and he takes pride in his work, fashioning thousands of tools, horseshoes, and ornate ironwork for the homes and estates nearby. In the vernacular of English society, Claude is a commoner, meaning that he is not of noble birth. In the hierarchy of ancient England, Claude's ancestors were on the lower rungs of the social ladder, and their lives were often devoted to serving the nobility as servants or craftsmen like Claude and his father. In the new millennium, most of the world's monarchies are gone. Not so in England. The royal family is still a fixture of the island nation. The centuries have minimized the gulf between commoner and monarch, and a craftsman like Claude now enjoys a standard of living and freedoms far different from his ancestors. He lives well, with a nice automobile and home, and he has time for a hobby away from blacksmithing. Claude is one of England's 250,000 racing pigeon fanciers. With his older partner George, Claude is like thousands of other English pigeon men who look forward to the spring and summer weekends when they race their birds. They're a successful team and do well against local competition. But it is that local competition that makes this story of the village blacksmith an unusual one. Each week, the pigeons of these commoners compete against the race birds of Her Majesty, the Queen of England, Queen Elizabeth. We have the Queen's Loft in, in our club, which is a great plus for us, a big bonus. I think she could be out to join any, any club she'd like to, and we're lucky to have her at Fakenham. We really appreciate that. From the ground, they look like any other flock of racing pigeons taking their afternoon exercise. But these birds of peace above the quiet English countryside are special. These are royal birds, part of a lineage of homing pigeons that have belonged to the royal family since the 1800s. The Majesty of the Queen keeps a keen interest in the pigeons. She's very interested in the results, especially from the distance. She tries to explain um, to me in the past when I first all oh, hope and pray they do. They fly over the Queen's estate at Sandringham, a huge area of forests, fields and charming stone homes that have belonged to the royal family for generations. The Queen of England does not actively care for her animals. That job is left to the staff of Sandringham, such as her horse trainers and pigeon loft manager. The current keeper of the royal flock is a veteran pigeon man, Carlo Napolitano. I take it as a great honor to be asked to keep the pigeons for Majesty of the Queen. Oh, we have people in our local club who think it's a great honor to race against the Queen, and they get a big enjoyment when they beat the Queen. And I must admit, I got to get a big enjoyment when the Queen beats them. But uh, it's all good fun, it's all good fun. In more than 100 years, Carlo is only the fourth manager of the royal lofts. And as the last few years of race results show, Carlo is one of the best in history. On occasions, really rare occasions, some of us managed to beat the Queen, and uh, uh, but that's uh, that's something a little bit special. And uh, but most of the time, we have to say, "Well, after you, Mum." Having the Queen among the ranks of pigeon fanciers makes England unique in the sport of racing, and Her Majesty's membership is far from ceremonial. Several times a year, Carlo is a guest at Sandringham and provides the Queen with a summary of how her birds are doing. The Majesty of the Queen keeps a keen interest in the pigeons. She's very interested in the results, especially from the distance. She does, really does enjoy the pigeons. She visits the lofts when she's this way and has the time. The honor of caring for the birds of the Queen is a great one, but it's not an easy job. There's no pay involved with the duties, and when he was asked to take over the job following the death of his predecessor, Carlo had to ponder his decision carefully. Her Majesty the Queen asked me to pick from six different sites. We decided on this site, and so we moved into this house and they erected the loft, and uh, this is um, where we've spent the last 10 years. But as far as actual wage go, there's no wage at all. Um, I do it in my spare time the best that I can. 
Um, but Her Majesty and the Royal Estate pays for every, everything to do with the pigeons they pay. Being the Royal Loft Manager has its perks. Among them is representing the Queen to the pigeon world, such as when a group of visiting Chinese fanciers present Carlo with a gift of pigeon whistles and a handmade screen that will be taken to Her Majesty. Being a queen has distinct advantages. A fine pigeon loft, birds with strong racing blood, and a full-time manager with a lifetime of experience at winning prizes. But natural conditions affect this sport that even Her Royal Majesty is powerless to change. Those challenges are geography and the wind. We're right on the east coast. We're literally only about one mile actually from a stretch of water called the Wash, which, which makes it quite hard to race here because at the end of every race, they have to cross that Wash. If they don't cross the Wash and go round, you've lost. Unlike a tiny country such as Belgium where the competitors are relatively close together, England is divided into five racing districts. There's an Irish Union, a Welsh and Scottish Union, and England itself has a North and South Road competition. The South races from release points in France. The North Road, as it's called, involves races from points as far north as the Shetland Islands. Within its racing districts, English competition is the same as in other parts of the world. Small clubs exist in villages, bigger clubs in cities, and the combination of these groups comprise a federation. The majority of racing is overseen by the Royal Racing Pigeon Association. The RPRA provides services to member clubs by selling them registered bands, monitoring release points, and calculating distances. The organization also runs a full-time service to get stray race birds back to their registered owners. Most competition involves fanciers racing their birds to their own home loft. Claude, Carlo, and the Queen belong to the huge Peterborough Federation that flies the North Road. The level of competition on England's North Road from Peterborough is so intense, it attracts many fanciers who hunger to race against the most competitors. A man with this kind of pigeon passion is Frank Tasker. A decade ago, Tasker and his wife Anne moved from the center of England to the East Coast in order to spend their retirement racing in the Peterborough Fed. We moved uh, 120 miles from our home in the Midlands to where we are today just to compete against the people in this big organization. Although the North Road is a legendary English race course with thousands of birds in each event, these great pigeon races have humble beginnings. That's because a federation is made up of many small neighborhood units. To get his birds into the bigger competition, Tasker's Gateway is a tiny club in the village near his home. Shipping night takes place in an old garage at the back of the local hotel. Each member helps out marking the race birds. Once in the baskets, these birds travel a few miles south to be joined with the birds from much larger clubs, such as the Greater Boston Organization. During the night, baskets from small and large clubs are loaded onto the transport truck and the total number of pigeons in the race grows. Birds from the east, including those of the Queen, are now on board. After the fanciers go home to sleep and wait for their birds the next day, the man in charge of the starting gate, the race liberator, takes over. Most liberators are men with years of experience in pigeon care, weather, and knowing when the conditions are right to start the race. On this quiet summer English morning, the transport of the Peterborough Federation disgorges almost 5,000 pigeons into the sky. As the birds return from the race, each one is timed into the pigeon clock. Unlike many clubs on the continent, England has still not adopted electronic timing, and to record a bird's arrival, the owner must still remove the rubber countermark and place it in a sealed timer. When the race is over, and the majority of the birds are home, the Wainfleet Club, like so many others, meets in the back room of the local pub, and there, among their beers and timesheets, the winner of the race is determined. This short young bird race was not Tasker's day. As he came in second to a happy member of the club who knows that on any given day, beating Tasker's birds is quite a feat. Obviously, uh, the first young bird race of the season, it's always uh, uh, an iffy situation. You're putting uh, pigeons out there with very little experience. Despite his total dedication to creating champions, 
Tasker knows the degree of random fortune that governs this sport and the irony that nature can produce a magic bird in the unlikeliest place. Probably no pigeon story illustrates that more than the origins of the greatest racing pigeon in English history, a bird called Breakaway. His mother was an immigrant to England in the early days of the 1970s. Barely a month old and bearing a band from the Netherlands, she was found in the center of the country. How she came there is a mystery. As luck would have it, she came into the hands of one of England's greatest pigeon men. I looked in a box and he got a, a massive down of yellow here, which is, shows real quality feather when it comes out. I thought, God, that's beautiful, but it was so thin. I thought, it's been out for a few days. I fetched it out of the box, turned its ring, and it was a Dutch pigeon, a baby. I thought, how can a Dutch pigeon be in England at that age? The hen then went to a friend of Arthur's who mated it with a male in his loft. As fate would have it, another trainer, Ron Green, happened to visit this loft and took a liking to a young pair of babies from the Dutch hen. Little did Ron Green know that the bird he would take home for free would become the greatest racer in English history. He is the finest athlete that's ever been born of any creature. It won 59 first prizes, including 15 times first federation. In England, they call pigeon racing a cloth cap sport. It means the hobby is enjoyed by working people who wear this type of cap. Men like Ron, a factory worker born and raised near Birmingham, in England's industrial heartland. Ron Green is a gentle person. The training Ron gave Breakaway is the same he gives today to the great bird's grandchildren, who still win races from this loft in the English Midlands. Ron spends time taming the pigeons, getting them to have the courage and comfort to fight back his hand, to defend their nest space. The best ones seem to delight in this tussle with their trainer. This is exactly the way Breakaway behaved. He was just a damn good, intelligent pigeon with a big heart and the love of home. And I think that was bright guy, champion of champions. The motivation to literally break away first from the race basket, to sprint home many minutes in front of thousands of competitors is what made Breakaway a champion, winning almost 60 races in his seven year career. Most experts doubt this record will ever be matched. For Ron Green, Breakaway was a once-in-a-lifetime pigeon, and much more than just an animal that won races. To Ron, the bird was a friend of many years, and if you ask him what made this bird fly faster than all the others time after time, what made his friend the greatest pigeon in English history, Ron has an easy answer. Effort, 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 extra effort it put in to get home. For the love of the box and my... The story of Britain's breakaway shows one of the magical qualities of the pigeon sport. A champion bird can sometimes be born in the unlikeliest place. And a country such as England also illustrates another dramatic component of this worldwide hobby, where the queen is also a competitor. When you think of it, she doesn't play football for anyone. She doesn't play cricket, she doesn't play hockey, but she plays racing pigeons with us, the working men. What more could we ask for? Knowing that the richest woman in the world is willing to continue a family tradition and is willing to compete and lose shows her subjects their queen is a champion of another sort, a champion of fair play and equality. It's appropriate that this message is sent on the wings of the bird of peace. The magic of this sport is that on any given day, a great pigeon with the heart for home can be a champion and bring pride to its owner be they commoner or queen.